Hello everyone, my name is Pratip Nayak and I'm at the University of Waterloo in the Faculty of Environment. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm also uh, representing and I'm a part of the V2B Global Partnership for Small Scale Fisheries. Uh, today, I am extremely happy to welcome you to the event titled as Rethinking Coastal Sustainability and Development. And this event is uh, being uh, organized as part of a field school, virtual field school that is ongoing at the moment for over the last one week. Um, B2B partnership is a global uh, network of you know, academics, uh, NGOs and uh, researchers and government people to work on uh, creating strong uh, small scale fisheries or fishing communities around the world with specific focus on Africa and Asia. As part of this field school, uh, we are you know, doing this public event today. Uh, and I am extremely happy to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Jean Andre, who is the Dean uh, of uh, Faculty of Environment in Waterloo uh, to chair this session. Just as a brief introduction to Jean, uh, Jean's research program focuses on weather and society uh, with specific attention to weather hazards climate change impacts, uh, adaptations and societal responses. Uh, she has particular attention to weather and climate interactions with transportation. Uh, so lots of good experience there uh, that relates to this uh, field school, of course, but to the, to the event itself. But as the Dean of uh, Canada's first environment faculty, <laughs> an acclaimed leader, innovator and sustainability champion. It is my privilege to invite Dr. Jean Andre to chair this special event on rethinking coastal sustainability and development. And uh, the session is particularly focusing on power, a power, two power talks and uh, words that inspire. Over to you, Jean, uh, please. Thank you so much, Pratip, and, and hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this year's Chilica Field School, something that my friend and colleague Pratip has talked about for some time. And I know that many of you have been working together to understand and respond to challenges facing coastal small scale fisheries, a matter that grows increasingly urgent over time. The Faculty of Environment at Waterloo is, is uh, very honored to host this field school as the largest school of environment in Canada. Uh, we have a strategic plan that's called together for a sustainable future. And of course, we are committed to working together as that suggests. And I know that's what this whole school is about. Um, as, as we're all aware, and as Pratip has reminded us, the focus here is on rethinking. And we're very, very privileged to have two thought provoking um, gurus of sorts, uh, leaders in their own spheres to, uh, to share their thoughts with us today about uh, how we can work toward a, a better world. And so I will introduce the speakers just before they begin. And uh, after each speaker, we'll have time for some questions, which you can um, put up your golden hand. If you are part of the field school, you'll find that under the reactions button in Zoom. Um, or you can um, otherwise type your um, messages into the, to the text. So with, uh, with those logistics out of the way, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker then. Dr. Fikret Burks is an applied ecologist who works at the interface of natural and social sciences. His formal education was in marine science, including a master's and PhD from McGill, after which he became a student of, and eventually a global leader in, community-based resource management. In chapter one of his most recent book, Toward a New Social Contract, he shares his journey as a scholar and the many individuals, organizations, and disciplines that have shaped his thinking. His career as a professor began at Brock University, after which he joined the University of Manitoba in 1991 as the director of the Natural Resources Institute. Dr. Burks was a faculty member at the University of Manitoba for 25 years, during which time he was a Canada Research Chair, a prolific writer, and a much-loved much loved graduate advisor. He's provided leadership on many initiatives and organizations, including the International Association for the Study of Common Property, the UN Equator Initiative, 
the Millennium Ecosystem Assessments, the Resilience Alliance, editorial boards, and more. He's devoted most of his professional life to investigating the relations between societies and their resources and to examining the conditions under which the tragedy of the commons may be avoided. His focus on the commons and his emphasis on adaptive co-management, complex systems, resilience, indigenous knowledge, and tools for change has shaped the thinking of an entire generation of scholars and practitioners worldwide. Dr. Burks, it is our great pleasure to have you address the school and our esteemed audience who are joining us on live stream. Thank you, uh, Dean Andre, and, and many, many thanks to the organizers, to Pratip, Seville, the coordinator and others. Uh, can you hear me? Is the volume good? Um, yes, I'm... <clears throat> I, I haven't met very many of you, obviously, <laughs> and this is not the best way to, to, to interact, but uh, we'll do the best we can. I'm, I'm coming to you from central Canada. This is the, the middle of Canada. In fact, the middle of North America, geographically center of North America, a city called Winnipeg. I'm a professor at the University of uh, Manitoba, uh, where we have many fires right now. Uh, as you know, um, parts of Canada, countries in the Mediterranean are having some, some major forest fires, partly having to do with the, with the climate change and some unusually hot weather. Um, where I sit here, um, I can smell the smoke from the fires, and, um, um, but I'm going to be restraining myself and not talk about climate change. We're going to talk about much nicer things than climate change, I hope. And as you know, today uh, we will end with a focus on, on happiness. So that, that doesn't go with, uh, with too many fires. Um, the, um, do I do something to get my, my picture or can everybody see me on the screen? You have to share, um, your, you have to share your screen. Yeah, you have to share your screen. At the bottom, you'll see a a green button that says share screen. Share. So what happened there? Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, we're seeing um, an advertisement there. Back. If, if you open the, open the picture, um, go and click on the picture. Okay, I'm, I'm clicking on, on uh, which my picture? The one that you want Our to show. Screen sharing, okay. I'm clicking on the, uh, start over, stop share, okay. And start over again. What do I click on? Share screen? On so the is, is the photo you want to so open already on your desk, desktop? Pretty can't hear you well. So the bottom one? Yeah, the share screen one, the green one. But when I yeah, do The green share screen button. And make sure that the image that you want to show us is open on your screen. Okay, my image is open on my screen. <clears throat> and then... Share screen. No, I'm still getting. So who's the <laughs> who's the screen guru here? Do you want to? You could always send your slides, I suppose, to um to Pratip or someone else who can put them up. Showing slides. No problem. You I'm wondering if I should just have my own picture on screen, or, or we don't need, I guess. No, you don't need, you know, you can speak, you know, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm, yeah. I'm just speaking. Yeah, as you don't need a, need, need a uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, for, for the course participants, uh, one good news is I'm not showing any, any PowerPoints, any, any, any pictures, um, but, but you'll see me sitting on my coffee because this is eight o'clock and I, I 8 a.m. in the morning and I, I got up rather early for this. <clears throat> uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to be talking about 
uh, the, the topic is towards a, a new social contract. And uh, those of you who had a chance to, um, no, I, I can't assume you've, you've read the book. The field, field course is fairly intense and you haven't had chance to read very much, I, I imagine. But uh, I, I believe you've been sent a copy of the book and uh, you, can, you can look at it at your leisure. I'm going to start with a story. Once upon a time, there were two philosophers. In fact, uh, it's not mystical early time, but some centuries ago, these are two Western philosophers that held opposite views on, on what uh, human relationships were to one another, to the state and to the environment in general. One was a British philosopher, um, and uh, his name was Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes wrote a major philosophical treatise that, that influenced a lot of people in the West. This is early industrial age. It was called Leviathan. Leviathan means something very big and it refers to um, the, the sovereign ruler. And uh, he probably had in mind the British king at the time. And as for, for many of you, the, the British king is probably not one of the nicer figures around that time. But Thomas Hobbes' argument was the necessity of a higher authority, necessity of a higher authority. He said societies needed the absolute dominance of a sovereign ruler as the source of law. People were incapable of collective action. They, they couldn't really do things unless, unless there was, there was that, that big power who, who told them, who told them through their various agents about what to do. Um, his, his view was very influential. It covered, it, it colored much of the writing in both arts and sciences. For example, it's the basis of the dog-eat-dog -dog social Darwinism. Uh, in fact, Darwin himself uh, held views that struggled for uh, survival, uh, struggle of the fittest, survival of the fittest, etc. And today it still carries on with the neoliberal tradition. <clears throat> In contrast to Hobbes, the other philosopher, who's a French philosopher, Jean Jacques Rousseau, was influential on the French Revolution and he had a very different view of, of people and society. He said um, in his book, The Social Contract, that's, that's where I'm getting my title from. He talked about egalitarian rural communities. Uh, he said, running the affairs of the state under an oak tree, quote unquote. And um, he said the, 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 that was the natural order of society that, that, that people could, could actually uh, work together and, and run the affairs of the state. And it, it really was in accordance to an understanding between the state and the citizen. That is what he called the social contract, an agreement whereby uh, there was a balance between the state and the citizen. The citizen relied on the state to do certain things, but the, but the citizens could also do, do things on their own. So the social contract I think that um, Dr. Brooks may be frozen. We'll maybe wait a moment and hope he comes back. It's him, yeah. This is always one of the challenges when um, we get together virtually. We need to wait for technology to catch up with our, our thirst to share. I think he's perhaps disappeared. Perhaps he'll come back in in a moment. For those of you who are listening, um, just so you know, there are about 45 of us together in the 
in the Chilica uh, Field School. And normally this would be held in the, in the East Coast of, of, of India uh, in, a, in, a, in a physical field school. And uh, our, our, our participants have been together now for I think seven or eight days and uh, they're nearing the end of, a, of an important journey. Can you hear me? Okay, we're back, yep. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. So we're talking about social contracts. So as practiced today, there is often a social contract. A la Rousseau, you might say. But that social contract uh, in most parts of the world involves top-down decisions. So that you might say a la Hobbes. Um, the States tells us how we should go about sustainability and development. The state tells us many things. The state has experts who know best on, on how to do fisheries, how to do other kinds of management, climate change, etc. The problem is things are not going very well uh, with sustainability and development as, as, as we've been discussing in this course. When I was younger, things were not going all that well at that time either. Remember, I, I come from the 1970s generation. We were the people who started environmental activism in the, in the West. Uh, I, of course, acknowledge that there were environmental activism in, in many parts of the world, like the Chipko movement in India and so on around those times. But uh, this, this is uh, it's, uh, the, the generation that had the first Earth Day, for example. Um, and at the time, as a, as a graduate student and, and later as a young faculty, I, I thought everything was moving much, much too slowly, too little, too slow. Um, and I, I know that, that, that many of you, most of you feel that way in terms of uh, our sustainability and development, that things are... are, are not really going all that well, it's much, much too slow. Uh, but in my case, um, looking back at now as a gray beard, I, I've changed my mind about that. And uh, I have a different view on, on the, 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 our progress. And I think we are moving towards a new social contract now. You might say, well, it doesn't look too good, but I'll explain. I'll explain using another story. This is a story from the Canadian North, the, the Inuit lands uh, in the Arctic of Canada. And I take you back to the 1990s. Now to many of you, that's still ancient times. We're talking almost 30 years. So these are the, the, the early years of climate change. Uh, climate change being recognized, climate change being mainstreamed. Um, What happened in the 1990s towards mid late 1990s is that the Inuit in many communities were observing unusual things. Uh, the, the community I interacted with is called Saks Harbor in, in Beaufort Sea, which is part of the Arctic Ocean. And they were seeing some, some really odd things. They had some very hot summers. The ice was disappearing in the summer, which, which it didn't before. Uh, permafrost was melting. Now, permafrost, of course, means eternally frozen ground. So if permafrost melts, that's, that's rather unusual. They're also making other observations. One was that they were catching Pacific salmon in the Arctic Ocean, which, which really seemed odd to them. They, they, didn't, they hadn't seen though, that species, those species before. Uh, and another observation was that they were having thunder and lightning. Now, for most of you, all of you, that's, that's something that, that's not all that unusual, but in the Arctic it is. Because to have thunder and lightning, you need a hot air mass and a cold air mass, and they collide. When they collide, you get, you get thunder and lightning. Um, the Inuit, seeing all these unusual things, sent a note to the Federal Department of the Environment and their headquarters in Ottawa. And they said, these are things we're seeing what, what do we make of this? What, what is going on? And the government department ignored them. They didn't re respond. In fact, 
we, we strongly believe they, they threw the, the note from the Inuit right into the garbage. They said, impossible, this is a high Arctic. You're not going to get thunder and lightning because you don't have warm air mass to collide with what cold air mass. Well, to make the long story short, uh, of course, the Inuit were right. And uh, there was thunder and lightning and it's become more frequent. And the reason was that the front the 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 the, uh, the climate front, if you like, uh, that used to be in the Bering Sea had shifted. Of course, the fronts don't stay in one place; they move up and down. But it had shifted some 300 kilometers. So, where this community was sitting, in fact, was having uh, at times this 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 uh, interaction between different air masses, which which never happened before. So local knowledge of the Inuit was in, in, in some ways ahead of government scientific opinion at that time. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's strange because you have indigenous people alerting southern Canada and the scientists of, of government of Canada about the realities of climate change. We, we later did some, some work with the Inuit of Saks Harbor. We also know that they were also as of late 90s, early 2000s, showing adaptive responses, coping responses to climate change, which was the first documented cases of, of, uh, of, of that kind of response that, that the government knew nothing about. And um, uh, so, so we have a strange situation, an ironic situation, where you mark a reversal of the social contract roles. Um, indigenous people leading uh, the collection of, of uh, climate change evidence uh, to warn and protect mainstream society and the government. Now, uh, the, uh, I don't have a lot of time, to, obviously, to, to expand on all this, but uh, uh, what we're seeing, and, and this is the reason I've, I've changed my, my, my views on this matter, is that uh, local people and resources, local people and other resource users all over the world have, have become more influential in the way sustainability and, uh, and, uh, and development is being done. Uh, people are asserting themselves to co-manage land and resources uh, we have a new social contract involving participatory processes in a democratic sense. So that's that's what I've been observing since the 1970s, and and that that has been a real change. That if you look at it in the short term, you don't really see it, but if you look at it over over a longer term, from uh, in, in my case 70s onwards, you really do see a change. Uh, so there's a quiet revolution in governance, in fisheries, in food security, in climate change, conservation, indigenous rights, social justice. And as a gray beard, when I look back, the world does look very different and different, in fact, in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we'll open now to the Chilica Field School participants to make comments or ask questions. Maybe as they um, as they queue up, you know, I'll start with one. You know, I want to share your optimism, but sometimes I worry that um, the power that's held by a small number of um, business interests exceeds the power of government, and 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 therefore the the relationship that people have to their state. I wonder if you could comment a little on that. Um, yeah, uh, we're, we're focusing on the positive and uh, the, what you mentioned is, is the not too happy part of the story. I, I really see this, these two forces balance, trying to balance one another or trying to gain supremacy. On the one hand, I see a lot of community-based management going on, but on the other hand, exactly what you say. And it's, it's frightening because they have more power, they have more money, they have the ear of the government that obviously local resource users do not have. Um, how it's going to play out, the, these processes are both going on at the same time. 
how it's going to play out is going to be very interesting. And for our younger people, uh, it's something to watch for. But uh, um, obviously the opposite of community-based management is, is a new liberal kind of order where in fact, the governments are even shunted aside and, and these big corporations make the decisions and, uh, and, and privatize everything. So, you know, it's, it's like privatizing the fisheries in, in Lake Chilica. Um, you, 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 you shunt aside the, uh, the small scale fishery and you, you put in a money making aquaculture operation. So very concerning. Okay, thank you. I'm, I, if you're a member of the school, please feel free to raise your hand. That's under reactions down below. And I'm just watching to see if I see any, any golden hands. If, uh, if there aren't any questions at this time, maybe I can, uh, oh, there we have one. Um, Pia, Pia Conis Foluco um, Arello, Arella, please. Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Uh, I got very interested in your to the, the topic social contracting, that is balancing between the citizen and the authority. And when you relate that to the last part about um, some community having uh, power over government, can you expand about the two? the balancing between the citizen, the authority, and some economic powers being able to have, um, take decisions over and above what government would want to do. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, you, you know, people who work in that area, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert myself, but pe people say, power is not given, power is taken. Uh, in, in Canada, the indigenous people have taken power through land claims agreements and co-management. Uh, these are legally mandated power sharing arrangements. Um, you see them in Australia. You see them in, 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 a, in a number of countries, but, but they're not that common. Most co-management, which is sharing of responsibility and power, most co-management is, is informal. It, it can be, these are rights that can be rescinded fairly quickly. Not in Canada, not in Australia. There are a few other countries like that. Um, there's a lot of co-management, for example, in the Philippines, but I'm not sure how robust that co-management is. There's a lot of co-management in India. Some of it is, well, <laughs> we have experts here who can comment on that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of community-based forest management, for example, that Pratip used to work on before he developed those huge fish that he sits under there. Um, so um, yeah, you have to you have to fight for your rights. You have to fight to to share power. No doubt about that. Thank you for your question, Deaconess. There's a question here from uh, Sylvia Salas. It's how technology have, has changed the way we see and approach environmental issues. So um, it says we have more environmental problems, um, or we can be more aware of them. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. She was she was putting this in the chat. So I don't know, Rickard, if you want to talk about technology at all. Well, it, it's a big and complicated issue. Technology can cut either way. Um, obviously, it serves the interest of larger corporations, as, as we were commenting on a moment ago. It serves it much better. But, but also, um, mass media and technology has been very good for, for um, for community-based resource management. We were working in Bangladesh and, and we noticed with, you know, some admiration that, that people were not just interacting with government bodies, but they were interacting community to community. There's a lot of South-South exchange going on <clears throat> that, uh, that, that us scholars don't even know about and government certainly don't know about. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of that. I, I'd say use it use technology when you can. And, and there are a lot of advantages to that. Okay, thank you. I think the point you make is that a lot of times we're not aware of what the other is, do, is doing. And I think the, the need for humility as we learn from one another is one of the most critical things. So 
Um, well, thank you so much for that, um, those inspiring stories and setting the tone here. Well, people will have a chance to ask questions or to make comments as we move um, forward in the agenda. But at this point, I'm going to take um, a moment to introduce our, our second speaker and to give him the floor for a bit. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the Venerable Samdu Shetri, who is a visiting professor at the Reiki Center of Excellence for the Science of Happiness at the Indian Institute of Technology in Karakpur, which I had the pleasure of visiting just before, indeed, just as COVID was breaking out. Um, he's also the head of the Gross National Happiness Center for the country, Bhutan. And um, I first had the pleasure of meeting him then in, when, in 2019 when I was visiting, and I had the honor of sharing the front of the classroom with him while we were interacting with students. His personal story, though, is, is also interesting. It's, it's one of humble beginnings. He, he notes in an interview that uh, I was born in a cow shed, he says, and as a teenager, um, my day on the farm began at four o'clock in the morning when I would walk a kilometer to fresh, fetch fresh water before doing farm chores. His forming, formal schooling was intermittent. An older brother arranged for him to go to school from age nine to 14, and he later returned to school, earning multiple degrees and credentials over time in India, in Australia, in the UK. In the 1980s, freshly out of college, Bhante Chetri was called on by his government to bring about the king's wish to develop Bhutan's newly emerging private sector. And by his own admission, this was a challenging appointment after which he returned to his rural roots for a time. But then when Bhutan elected its first democratic government about 15 years ago, he was summoned back to the capital and asked to work for the cabinet office of Bhutan's first freshly elected democratic government. Five years later, he was the chosen to head up Bhutan's first Gross National Happiness Center, something that he continues to do. He has been teaching, consulting, and speaking at various international and national assemblies on mindfulness, ecology, governance, and the Gross National Happiness Project. He is described as a pilgrim of love and compassion. We are delighted that you're willing to be with us today, Samdu. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, we can't hear you, Sam. Do I think you have to put your uh, your mute off, please? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yes, I was. Mute. Um, thank you so much for this lovely introduction, which I don't think I really, uh, you know, desire that that length of uh, introduction. Um, I'm just a, a monk now, practicing monk. I don't live in a monastery, but I just try to wear the dress and try to believe that I am a monk. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, my topic is um, quite interesting. I'm, I'm quite sure. Let me just share the screen. Um, this is a, all right. So what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is try and bring the two sciences of the ancient wisdom and the modern science together to see how mindfulness is the way or the path or the secret to the seat to happiness. Uh, before that, may I request all of you to sit very comfortably on your chairs with your eyes completely closed. And just continue breathing in and out. Follow your breath in. Feel the calmness of your mind. When you exhale your breath, feel the relaxation of your body. Breathing, stay calm in your mind, referring to your mind. Breathe out and stay relaxed, referring to your body. Please visualize now what are things around you on your right hand side. Just try to find those in your mind. Maybe it's a wall there. Take your thoughts at the back and try and visualize what is at the back of you.
take your thoughts to your left side and try and visualize what is on your left side. Bring your thoughts in front of you and visualize what other things are apart from your screen in front of you. Continue to breathe in deeply and exhale slowly. In this, Put one as a number in your mind without visualizing how it looks like as you're breathing. And when you breathe out, visualize number one. Breathe in, say two. Breathe out, visualize two. Breathe in, say three. Breathe out and visualize three. Continue to breathe in deeply and feel the calmness of the mind. Breathe out slowly and feel the relaxation of your body. And just scan your body from toe to head, going part by part, your soul, your ankle, your calf muscle, your knees, your thighs, ask them to relax and soften. Thank them for being there for us. Go to your lower back, keep it erect, your shoulders relaxed. Thank the hands for being there for us to do a lot of activities, playing, writing, giving. And just thank your brains, the five senses, and the wonderful heart for being there for us, including our internal parts that help metabolism and keep us alive. With this, please bring back your thought to your body without opening your eyes, rub your hands hard, put them against your eyes, gently open your eyes halfway, hold it there for a little while and continue breathing in and out. When you're ready, you can then open your eyes completely filled with love and compassion. All right, thank you so much for this little exercise. Um, so let's go, continue on our journey. So what does the ancient wisdom say to us? It says, Vasudaiva Kutummakam. It's a Sanskrit word, which means the world is one family. Now, if you look into our own creation, we know that half the seed of mother, which is called half Lloyd, and half seed of father, which is also called the half Lloyd, gets into the mother's womb to form a diploid, which we call zygote in, in biology terms, I suppose, which is the size of 0 0.005 inch, barely visible to our naked eye. Now imagine nine months, this one little seed becomes a baby and we are born. What makes this baby grow? We know it's the food. Although there are genetics, codes that tells what to form in a body, but the body formation is out of the food. Where does the food come from? From the mother earth. So there is this term called Bhagawan in India, which translates into God. But Bhagawan stands for, the first word Bha stands for Bhumi, the earth. The second word stands for Gagan, the sky. And there is no association of the form in our body, but definitely our five senses are assigned to Gagan. 
And we also say Bhaga A one, but A we don't write, which stands for Agni, the fire. Now, on a human uh, average cells, we talk about 37.2 trillion cells, including the children and a big man. The average is 37.2 trillion cells in a body. Now, every cell is supposed to have energy equivalent to 1.4 volt. If you multiply that with 37.2 trillion cells, we are having about 52 billion trillion voltage in our one body. That's why probably when we close our eyes and think any planet on earth, we are there faster than the light. We can think, visualize anybody and bring them right here and talk to them in fact. This what the quantum physicists, the, uh, uh, you know, the father of the string theory, Micho Kaku says that with this energy, when we vibrate, we can, if we know how to vibrate at the levels of different animals that existed on this planet, including dinosaurs, then definitely we will see them and feel them around us. This is the power of our energy that we carry, which is a uh, Wa, Bhaga Wa. Wa stands for Vayu, the wind. And we can imagine that every cell needs oxygen and 37.2 trillion cells, even if we had tip of a pin as oxygen in one cell, we can imagine how much oxygen we are carrying in our body. And finally, na near water, which is a major part of our body. So the ancient texts, the ancient Indian wisdom talks about that we are made up of Bhagwan, which means we are in the five elements of the planet Earth and five elements of the planet Earth are in us. Now, what the ancient text also does talk about is that 12% of our body form comes from Mother Earth in form of food, in form of our cells. 8% is the energy, 8% is the air in our body, and 72% is the water. I mean, large part of it is proven, you know, genetically. So we can now think about if we are all built up of these five elements on planet Earth, why are we so different? Why do we think about this religion, that religion, you know, this sex, that sex, why do we divide ourselves? We are one and the same thing according to the ancient wisdom and genetically to a large extent, you know, it's been also proven. I'll come to that more on this. When we are very uh, distressed or unhappy and if we are with the nature, we suddenly realize that we become very calm simply because all the genetics that these elements, plants, animals on this planet, their genes are also with us. Genetic science talks about 70% of banana genes are in us, water of rice genes in us, 91% of frog genes are in us, 88% of cow genes are, I mean, you can think about, you know, fruit fly genes are in us, chicken genes are in us, plant genes, tree genes, all the genes are in us. And so, but how do we live? We live with an ego saying that the nature is out there to serve us. We are egocentric. But the truth is, if we form as an ecocentric, then we are with the nature. Because we should remind ourselves that without the nature, we can't exist. But the planet Earth will exist in some form or the other. The plants, animals, they can, they have their beautiful ecological systems. Human beings are actually the most undesirable species on this planet Earth. Because when you are egocentric, you, you are running behind the gross domestic product, meaning with greed field, you know, with excessive desires, and then we are destroying our planet Earth. But the moment we are ecocentric, we are more the gross national happiness practitioners, whereby we give an opportunity for the earth to rejuvenate, to also be, you know, help us live better lives. 
Anyway, so what determines happiness? According to the research, Sonia Limbersmiski, she says that 50% of our genes are actually determined, uh, happiness is determined genetically. 40% is by the circumstances we live, and 10% is our internal state of mind. This is what she has found. But if you listen to Dr. Bruce Lifton, uh, the father of epigenesis, he says that even this 50% can be, it's a blueprint that we get from our parents. And from the birth till seven years is the time where a child actually picks up hypnotically everything, sensing, seeing things, hearing things, picks up all everything. And that gets written down in so-called subconscious mind of ours. That's a research he's been doing for last 20, 30 years or so. And he's been proving this fact by his genetic research. And uh, he says that really uh, our genesis are just the um, blueprints, which we can change them. And as we grow, we see, we sense things, we live in an environment and we learn, we practice, practice, practice and rewrite in our subconscious. Now, going back to our ancient texts, Mahabharata, for example, the Indian text where Abhimanyu actually breaks the, um, the chakra view, which is the um, strategy of the, uh, the, the fortification in a war field. And he was not taught how to break that, but he had heard this story when he was in mother's womb. So according to uh, Lipton, it is seven years, but according to the ancient text, it's eight years. Probably they also count that when a child is in the womb, the child already begins to sense everything that mother sends, the mother feels around in the environment. So according to the ancient text, we call eight years of a child is the most from uh, being uh, in the mother's womb to until seven years is the time that the child is crucial where the child learns everything. Now, recently in South India, in Kerala, we had this wonderful little girl called Aryanand R. Babu, who sang in the little champ in uh, the Indian context. And she sang all the songs of Lata Mangeshkar, who is a uh, living nightingale of India. And she can't speak a sentence, forget about a sentence, a phrase of proper Hindi. But she could pronounce every word in that song perfectly and the singing was so perfect. And a doctor had accompanied her and the, his research found that she had begun to learn already when she was in mother's womb, you see? Because her mother is a, was a, is an avid listener of Lata Mangeshkar songs. So this proves us that what the modern science is trying to decode, it was already there in our ancient um, texts. So what actually, um, let me just move this away. Uh, so what, what mindfulness we call the seed or the path or the secret to happiness. Like I took you through in this beginning to feel around your own self. Now I'm sure many of you could not visualize what were things around you simply because we're never so mindful. And uh, if we are mindful, that means we are living at the present moment with everything around us, without judging, without uh, you know, um, assessing or evaluating. That is a play position when our mind are focused in something concrete, something very good. So let me just, um, oh God, it's not shifting, all right. So mindfulness is opposite to forgetfulness. Forgetfulness means living in the past or in the future. So uh, mindfulness is living in the present moment. Uh, mindfulness increases our conscious uh, mind work better because we believe uh, scientifically, they say that it's only 5% of our consciousness that we use every day. 95% is used by subconscious and forgetfulness, being living in the past or in the future. The moment we forego this, and try to focus ourselves in the present moment, we will have a much better, not only focus, but the power to captivate because 47% or so of our brains gets empty so that we have enough resources to really take in 
more and more. So mindfulness is not just meditation. It's much beyond meditation to be totally present in the moment where we are. Uh, even when you're washing your pots or pans, if your mind is completely focused in there, that means you are very present in the present moment. Mindfulness is about training our mind and really freeing our mind, freeing from the past or the future. Once we are able to do that, we are already creating a big space in our brains to really work better for our lives. And it is, uh, uh, you know, kritya. Uh, uh, it's a function, an act, an action that actually brings us in our process. When you do it, things rightly, it takes us to enlightenment. So we know that, I think time is running out, but let me just quickly go through them. So we know that the benefits of mindfulness is wonderful. So, you know, let me just highlight to you. Oxford did a study in 2012, and they, by the way, have a, I think, a department or at least a center of mindfulness. Uh, and in 2016, when I was in giving a talk to the, uh, the parliament, the British parliament there. Um, oh, dear. Uh, you know... Uh, You're on mute again, Sandhu. Somebody unmuted me. Okay, you're okay All right. now. Uh, so they, they also passed uh, you know, a resolution at the assembly uh, saying that um, mindfulness will be practiced in the health, social justice, and education. So the research that they did in 2012 indicated that people who have been meditating, you know, 75-year-old uh, people who have been meditating for some time or uh, for a long time were brought and their brains were compared with 25-year-old boys and they found exactly the same. They also brought people who never meditated and compared with the same group of uh, boys and they found that these elderly people had become very jittery, uh, you know, they, they would be very nervous. They are very forgetful. So things like that were very visible. Elizabeth Blackburn did another study, 30 years of study she did. In 2010, she wrote a book. She says that telomeres, uh, which are the tips of our chromosomes, increase their length. That reduces our aging process. So we also, uh, you know, live longer. There are a lot of other studies that are done that proves that our heart disease, our heart actions, all that actually calms down with mindfulness practices. And uh, Dr. Richard Davidson in 2010 said that we become also happier. Mindful practitioners are much happier. And 30% of gamma waves increased related with self-control, intelligence, happiness, and positive emotions. Same way Dr. Sarah Leisure in 2011 in Harvard did another study with students Eight weeks she took them, you know, she had a control group and a study group. And then what she found out was that eight weeks of practice gave that left hippocampus, you know, that helps us increase our memory was enlarged. Posterior cingulate cortex uh, that brings thousand thoughts in our minds was eliminated and focus increased. Amygdala, which is actually, uh, you know, brings us fear, stress, anxiety, which we also call the reptilian brain you know, it was reduced, decreased, uh, giving us more uh, flexibility to be more happy and good. Harvard in 2015, again, did another study to prove that you know, our willpower increases tremendously with mindfulness practices. So what are the mindfulness practices? There are five steps to it. First one is mindful breathing. If you realize when you are anxious, angry, jittery, lonely, you know, any emotions that you have, your breathing changes accordingly. But if you are in control of your breath, which means that you are completely in control of your own life existence. So therefore, breathing is one of the greatest practices in mindfulness meditation, uh, in mindfulness journey. You can do any time sitting in a chair, just close your eyes and just listen to your breathing in and out, feel the stomach rise, feel the stomach fall, feel the chest expand, feel the chest reduce. All you need to do is flow with the breath in and out. You will have a calming effect immediately. You, I'm sure you realize that when a child is sobbing after heavy crying, 
How does a child breathe? It, it does. <sighs> Try once this. You immediately have a calming effect. Just take two deep breaths, you know, and breathe out hard, you know, out once. You will realize immediately there's a calming effect. All right. The other one is focus or concentration. We can develop this through visualization practice, gazing, uh, listening to music, sound. There are multiple ways to uh, increase our focus. Awareness of body is so very important. Every two hours, you should try to sit on a chair and start visiting from toe to head. And when you visit a part, say, please calm down and relax, and then say thank you, and give the attribution of the part and say thank you. This, you know, complete your body. You'll have a very relaxing, immediately rejuvenate you completely. Same thing you can also do on bed when you're going to bed. One thing you have to add there is go to the park, say, please relax, calm down, give the attribute, say thank you. And the next thing you should say is that my eyes are getting heavier, I'm falling asleep. By the time you're midway, you would have gone into deep sleep. And tomorrow when you wake up, you have a much more quality sleep, better sleep. The other is the fourth one is releasing tension. So when you are in very tent, what you need to do is you need to just take deep breaths in and out three times. Enough, more than enough. <sighs> or you can take slowly, deeply in, and, you know, deeply in and slowly out. Either way works. But when you take slowly in and slowly out, do it more than three times, maybe six or nine times, you'll have a calming effect. The other one that is practice uh, as a very in ancient practice in Japan is, uh, you, know, you know, oriental practice is, if you are very um, worrying too much, they hold this thumb with their other hand, putting more pressure on the tip of the thumb um, for two minutes and just relax and breathe. If they fear, they hold this. If they're angry, they hold this for two minutes. If they are sad, they hold the ring finger for two minutes. And if they're lonely, they hold this. When you have multiple emotions, that is anxiety, uh, you know, the tips of the connections is all in the brain. So what they do is they pu put their thumb on the center palm and hold it there for two minutes so that the, you know, the anxiousness vanishes. I haven't practiced, you can try, I'm sure it works. The th fifth one is walking meditation. When you walk, walk with a pleasure, feeling as if you're kissing mother earth. You will see things, you will meet friends around, just greet them with your note, uh, see things around you. Don't judge them. Don't evaluate or assess them. See at them as they are and just progress. Just continue walking your um, way. All right. So um, do I have little time? You can take a few more minutes, Sam. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you know, there, you need to practice. Habit happens only like scientifically. They say you practice something 10,000 hours, you become an expert in it. But I tell you 42 minutes every day for 21 days, if you practice anything, you're going to perfect. So when you wake up, what you need to do is push yourself against the bedpost. Think about what you did yesterday. Think what are you going to do today better than yesterday and put a resolve today. If you have anger arising all the time or some kind of thing that touches you, put a resolve that you'll be calm and peaceful through the day. Then do three minutes of breathing exercise, at least three to six, nine minutes of breathing exercise, in and out, in and out. Then lie down on the bed, you know, stretch yourself, do a cyclic kick as many times, increase that. And once you step onto the floor, say, thank you, Mother Earth, uh, to give you a chance for another day. When you walk into the bathroom, look at that person that you see in the mirror and self-affirm to that person. You know, put your mission statements, your uh, vision statements in places that you, that you move around mostly. There's also a beautiful practice called the hugging meditation that I call the dose of happiness that gives you dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphin, which are happy chemicals. But that for that, you have to touch left to left heart, put each uh, chin in each other's left shoulder, embrace, and take three deep breaths in and out. In that, you send your gratitude and uh, loving kindness to one another and squeeze for a few seconds tightly after that three breaths and then release 
and look at each other with love and compassion. You will see that it changes your life altogether. Well, the rest I will not speak, but go to the next. So my mantra of happiness is be yourself. Don't look for others. Go inward. Try to see who we are, what we are. You know, that uh, we have realized that we are, whether, you know, even if you go to Christianity, we talk about Adam and Eve. If you go to Islam, we talk about um, there were two, uh, you know, two pairs. One pair was a bad pair and the other pair was a good pair. And if you go back into the history of humanity, something like uh, 50,000 years ago, there was a huge volcano eruption that killed everything, except there was a living about 1,200 people today. We are 7. Point, almost 8 billion people and we are from the same stock. So it doesn't make us very different from one another. Be present in every moment and conduct yourself with love, loving speech. Forgive self and others. See positive in others all the time. Have right intentions and efforts always. This is very important. Live in harmony with nature, serve others, and be grateful all the time. Say sorry and thank you every moment you have a chance. Send loving kindness to self and others. Keep mission statements and self-affirmations in mind all the time. Try to balance your time 888. Eight, eight. eight hours to sleep, eight hours to study or work, and eight hours for your home chores, 30 minutes of sweating exercise, your meditation, you know, your, your eating, drinking, listening to uplifting mu music, reading uh, inspirational books, all that, and quality time, all that is eight hours. If you can balance this, I can promise you happiness will arise naturally. Create habits from waking till sleeping are kind of a pattern. I don't call it uh, that you should go for it, but it's better. And life's essential things are three things. 30 minutes of sweating exercise, nourishing food. Please avoid meat and dairy products. You can go Google, look into California University's medical school. You will be shocked to see what is the negativity of it. Then uh, eight hours of sleep. Uh, Walker talks about when you sleep less, what happens is your chromosomes, the tip, the telomeres begin to get cancerous and it reduces. When it reduces, we heard Blackburn saying that if it increases, our aging process reduces, but if it decreases, then our aging process falls back. So you see even uh, Walker, Matthew, talks the same thing through his research. So friends, finally, um, this is my belief that every it is beautiful, even though we know our ultimate destination. We need to take it slow, but being fully present in what we do. With this, permit me to greet you, Tashi Dele, which means in my uh, language in Bhutan, uh, be there, be auspicious all the time in your lives. May you be well and happy always. May you find happiness in what you do. May you find, you know, may, may you bring happiness to the lives that you touch. May you be the light for yourself, your family, your community, your country and the world. Let me sing this happiness song and then I will leave the floor. Just a minute, please. <clears throat> because I can't let it go without it. And this song is for the mind, not for the body. Happiness is here and now. I have dropped my worry. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, and I'm not in a hurry. Happiness is here and now. I have dropped my worries. Somewhere to go, something to do. But I'm not in a hurry. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking more time. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a very inspiring um, time with you. And, and I, I can say I feel, I feel more relaxed. I, you know, I do worry that, especially in Western society, we have started moving faster and faster and spending less and less time on, on our mindfulness. You know, I'll just tell one quick story. I don't know if any of you watch... Um, 
women's sports, uh, you know, with the Olympics, there was lots to choose from, although sometimes less, but um, in 2019, when, when Bianca Andriscu, who was a Montreal 19 year old Canadian, played against Serena Williams for the US Open in tennis, um, she won and um, it made those of us who are Canadian very proud. But in the interview, they asked her, you know, how did you do that? And she, Sam Du said, it was mindfulness. I have been training and I have been coached on mindfulness. And when all of the um, energy in the room was against her, she was able to center. So thank you for reminding us about that importance. Hi. Do we have questions um, for either of our speakers now or comments that people would like to share with either of our speakers? You know, I think sometimes about, you know, I was thinking about the connection between the two, the two and, and um, Figred, you were talking about sort of egalitarian governance under an oak tree in one of your stories. And, and, and Samdu, you were talking about how 40% of happiness is circumstances. And I couldn't help but begin to wonder about whether the circumstances of an egalitarian and respectful place and time experiences um, isn't isn't if, if that isn't the connection between the two, I don't know if, if either of you would like to comment, but that's a piece that came to me. Yeah, the 40% that uh, Sonia talks about is from the circumstances, the environment that we live in. So if you look into um, like people who are mostly connected with nature, you know that they have a very calming effect naturally. So it is also uh, the circumstances that can change you, but the moment you are mindful, then what happens? You are internally connected with yourself. And that does not disable you from becoming taken away by the environment that you need. And now environment here plays, we are talking about natural environment, not only the human circumstances, but it is just beyond human beings. And we know that if we can change the 90% of our subconscious mind by rewriting that, knowing that these are the things that bother us, even in a concrete world, we can also create through our mind a greenery. We also can create an environment that we can live with. But the problem is that we're not, not doing this. And we see when we see concrete world, it brings a very gray effect to our, our, ourselves. Even there, when you look at them as they are and visualize in your mind all the green things that you have around or that the nature has around, it brings a very calming effect. So I don't know if that has a very good connection with the egalitarian you know, environment or circumstances, but that's how it, I would understand. Okay, thank you. Fred, do you want to add to that? or? Um... Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, Jean, thank you. For for that, for that uh, very astute observation. I, I think there really is a connection between uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's peasants under the oak tree and, and the mindfulness that, that, uh, that Samdu talks about. That, that yeah, um, that's a connection. The, um, the, the other thing I wanted to, to, to say, uh, Samdu, is that, is that the wisdom you share um, uh, is also reflected in some of the other ancient traditions, including not so well known ones. I was, as you were talking about what mindfulness looks like, I was I was reminded of some comments by a by an indigenous Canadian elder, a Cree elder, some years ago, who didn't use the word mindfulness. Actually, he doesn't even speak English, but but what he described the self-awareness uh, of the body uh, and, and uh, is, is very, very similar to what you have described. So, so, uh, so thank, thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. We do have a few questions coming in. I noticed Anna Carolina has her hand up um, and then um, there are a few others. So maybe Anna, I'll ask you to go first, please. Thank you very much and thank you for these two very um, interesting talks and I wonder also in this lines with the connection between the two how much um, the self-awareness or mindfulness or this experience of uh, being here and now and 
uh, being comfortable with ourselves and understanding ourselves as part of a whole um, that could help uh, the, the new social contract with more respectful decision making or how much this more personal uh, and individual understanding um, can help to deal with all these uh, social inequalities and also connect, connection to environmental management, for example, how that can help or if that, that is a possibility or how can we include that into these decision making arenas. Thank you. I think, Greg, you want to take that first, and then Sam Liu may have a few things to add. I, I'll go in reverse order now. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you know, respect is one of the R's that Indigenous people in Canada talk about. Uh, so that, that's really, really important. Uh, earlier, I mentioned co-management. Uh, one of the first things to do for management to be ultimately successful is to build trust, build respect. Um, and uh, in other words, not talk business about, you know, how to do fisheries and what regulations to change, etc. But but make that connection. Of course, Ana Carolina, you know this from Brazil, okay, because you've been you've been working with some some other people that that we both know. And uh, this, this is so important, the, the human relations, uh, if you like, mindfulness of resource management, mindfulness of environmental relations, that is a starting point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, if you're mindful or being aware, it's basically the same thing. There's different terms that different people use. Uh, mindfulness was started in 70s by Thich Nhat Hanh in the West, um, which now becomes a multi-billion billion dollar uh, industry in the West, but it's about the awareness. When you're completely aware who you are, what surrounds you, you are naturally respectful. You're naturally understanding everything that is around you. You, know? you cannot go wrong. So when you can't go wrong, socially, you have a social justice. You would see that very clearly. You can arise your voice so that you can help others as well, you know, you become completely, you would win yourself and you would also win the public, you know. So you'd have two victories, a private victory and a public victory through awareness. A person when he's aware, it's self-awareness, you are socially very much connected. You also are very motivated. A lot of good things, you know, emotional intelligence grows. Many things happen wonderfully. So it's a perfect way um, in fact, um, I think in many schools now, they're adding uh, mindfulness. For example, I know that in UK, like I was just saying, uh, in 2016, October, they passed a resolution in the parliament saying that mindfulness shall be practiced in health, education, and social justice. Now, if these three things are covered, you know, uh, uh, Britishers are going to change tremendously <laughs> becoming very aware and mindful and you know so they will in fact the greed also goes away because you realize how connected you are with each everyone you give more focus of connection with the, uh, to the nature you become a part of the nature you know and you realize somebody doing something wrong you do not argue that but you go and rectify it and let people see your own practice so things change tr tremendously and of course, if Waterloo becomes another mind, takes mindfulness journey together with your department, I can promise you that you will be number one in the world. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the floor, and then there's a few in the chat. So Navia Nair has the floor, please, to ask your question. Thank you, Jean. Um, so hi, I'm Nabia, student from University of Waterloo. So at first, I would like to thank for the great insights of mindfulness and the ways to rethink coastal sustainability and development uh, by both uh, Professor Prakat and uh, Sandhu Chetri. So the question I'm asking the question on behalf of Dr. Somnath Ghosh, a great acquaintance of Professor Chetri. Um, so his question is how a person with mental disbalance can follow and do exercises, as you mentioned. Or like how can how we can help that person with modern science and technology? Thank you. 
um, you, you, your question is how can we help someone who is mentally disturbed? Yes. That's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. You see, um, basically, this is a very difficult thing. There are practices, okay? There is management practices, which the clinical sci uh, you know, psychologists do this. But the first important step is that this person who is mentally disturbed agrees. And if that person agrees, all he needs to do is begin breathing in and out, just following the breath, just following the breath. If you can do that for three minutes, he will suddenly or she will suddenly realize how calming it is. A large part of the worry just, you know, evaporates just by that action. Okay, then, and then if you start connecting your mind with the body, then your mind and body becomes one, which means that you become mindful and the other thoughts that are bothering him actually or her actually reduces. And it is, it can't be just done in a day or two. It is a continuous practice and it needs to be practiced over and over again. So um, the quick solution is to go to a doctor and the other solution, if he's willing or she's willing, is to begin this breathing practice with connecting your body and mind. Okay, thank you. There was a question came in a, a while ago. In fact, I think it was shortly after um, Figure had finished uh, your address. And it was, the question was, can't we have a systemic planning before we start any new project and how that fits in with a new social contract is this, I think the question. Any comment on that or? It came in from the MP, MP School of Education. I don't know whether they want to elaborate. Systemic planning? Yeah, systemic planning. So, or systematic planning, I guess, systematic planning. Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess earlier I, I mentioned that, that human relations, including building trust, building um, respect, is, is part of that systematic planning before you launch into, into that kind of, um, <clears throat> into that kind of uh, new project. Uh, so one way, I guess, to start a new project, let's say in fisheries, would be just to go fishing together. The, the, uh, before you, you do the planning, before you do the project, or, or co-management negotiations, the idea isn't really to catch fish, but the idea is to, well, to be mindful and, uh, and uh, enjoy the water, enjoy. We, we actually did that with, with a very contentious uh, fishery management issue in British Columbia some years ago. I said, look, you know, just, just get out of the room, just go fishing together, enjoy, and then come back, it'll be, things will be much easier afterwards. That's, I think that's a lot of, a lot of wisdom. There, there's a, maybe a, an intersecting question about governance, it's, and this I think is mainly to figure it as well. It's about, you know, you're, you're talking about sort of co-management, adaptive management and so forth, but, and then there's this, this, this traditional sort of top down, but how do they coexist? Can they coexist? This is one of the questions that's come in. So, sorry, did you say, can we cause this? No, can they coexist? Can we actually have top-down governance right. that interacts in the right way right. with right. with, with uh, co-management? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> again, complicated. Depends on the case, I guess. But, um, but remember, co-management isn't community-based management, co-management already has that balance built in it. Uh, so for example, in the, uh, the committee conjoined at the James Bay um, land claims agreement, um, you have co-management, but for certain things, the final say rests with the minister, the government minister, but other things, the final decision rests with the community. So the, these, this is part of the initial agreement on, on, if you like, the social contract on, on who makes the big decision. Uh, and, and, it, and it works because it, it, it simplifies the, uh, the decision pathway. Okay. There's, there's another question come in for you and then, then hopefully we'll have 
um, one that maybe you can both speak to. But I, you were speaking about, I think, some of the Canadian and Indigenous fights that are, and challenges. And the question that came in is, you know, did they benefit from external support? And if so, where did that support come from in some of the cases that you can think of? Yeah, external support, <clears throat> capacity building, capacity development. That's, that's really important. Um, uh, we were working in the James Bay area on, a, on an indigenous-led protected area. Uh, this was a project led out of McGill. It had participants from Concordia, UBC, U Manitoba. Um, basically, the university people were the support for the community. We did the technical work. We did the technical advice. We wrote reports. Um, so that kind of, of, of building uh, capacity becomes very important because it's not really natural for communities to talk with government, but then it cuts both ways. <laughs> we wrote a paper some years ago called Tutu Tango. Uh, the Tutu Tango refers to the fact that, that both parties need to know how to tango, uh, and that includes the government. Government people are, are not uh, naturals in talking with communities and working with communities. <laughs> they have to learn to tango as well, not just the communities, thanks. Okay, that's, that's great. Are there any other questions from our, our school attendees? I wonder, um, oh yes, there we have, uh, Syed uh, Tuhid Rehan, please, yep. Uh, I would just like, uh, hi everyone, I'm Tawhid from Bangladesh and I would like to add that uh, happiness is nice in isolation. Uh, the fisher folk that are happy are content with their current lives, but I think that is, you know, leading to a bit of exploitation. Because since they're happy with their current income source, they're just happy to be alive. So they're not getting paid correctly, and they're being denied by uh, climate change as well as capitalists who are taking advantage of their situation. And once these, the capitalist model punishes uh, these people once they are of no longer of in use. And they either have to migrate or sell their homes and uh, go down. So I'm just saying, is contentment always uh, the correct procedure? Sam, that sounds like a good one for you to maybe comment on first. Well, you see, contentment uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're happy with what you have. Okay, uh, mindfulness makes you content, but you have your vision and mission where you need to work towards. Okay, it doesn't uh, let you be where you are. So um, you see, it, it is mindfulness can't change this. But when people are mindful in that whole society, they are going to change the government altogether. Because government then will function according to how the people behave. All right, so if I take the example of my own country, Bhutan, you see, top-down has worked in our country. It was the king who gave democracy to the people, despite people rejecting it, saying, no, we don't want that democracy. You are doing well. Continue ruling us. But he didn't. He, he, he just pushed it. Gene energy comes, the concept comes from the throne. But people now embrace it. Now the throne listens to the people. So he throws down to the people. Now people, you know, push back the whole thing up. Now, of course, we have a democratic government and uh, everything is designed from bottom up now. All the planning happens from bottom up. Funds flow directly to the uh, bottom and it is totally transacted at the bottom by the people. And it is so transparent and accountable that our uh, anti-corruption bureau is so strong that even two ministers in the first government got jailed. In the second government, Two ministers were thrown out. Now, at least one had some problem. You see, so I think it needs, the system needs to be strong. And who builds the system is the people. If the people are not aware, if the people say, uh, Chalo, what is happening, let it happen. And they get little money and they vote for a wrong person. Who is suffering? They are suffering. And we are only making noise. So our duty first is very important to reorganize ourselves and educate the people at the grassroots. What are their rights, responsibilities, 
not only just freedom as we think, but their rights, their responsibilities with the rights, and what are the rights of the government and their own rights. They need to know completely. And I'm sure many of these communities don't know anything about it. So unless and until we wake up and try to bring these things down there to them, I don't think we can make any changes. We'll only feel, we'll make noise about it, but things will never change. So we need to bring our awareness right at the grassroots. It's an inspiring note and we're almost at the end of our time. I noticed we also had an inspiring comment come in um, noting that in the Galapagos, they've started a process to co-create the vision for the seafood system and that they're positively changing their coexistence and that we hope it'll translate into a resilient system. And they specifically mentioned listening exercises and mindfulness. So there's a nice uh, connection between the talks and that example as well. Um, we're almost at the end. I wonder if, I, if I, either of our speakers or perhaps each of them would like to give a piece of advice to the, um, the Chilica Lagoon uh, School in terms of um, something that they should think more about or read more about or prioritize. Any parting words of wisdom? Pickret, maybe I'll have you go first. Uh, yeah, th this also is in, in part a response to the last question. I, I agree with everything Samdu <laughs> said, but I, I have a slightly different cut on this. Um, sort of go back to ancient history again, but some, some decades ago, there was a big debate among anthropologists about, about primitive people. And the, the dominant view was primitive life was difficult, et cetera, et cetera. So an anthropologist named Marshall Salins um, did some analysis and came up with this, the, uh, the idea that, that in fact, ancient people, uh, primitive people had a lot of leisure time. They, they really enjoyed themselves because their needs were so modest. Um, and the, the takeaway from this uh, for yourself, I, I don't know about University of Waterloo, but the takeaway from this is that, is that you, can, you can be quite happy with, with your expectations if your expectations are, are modest to begin with. But if you're if you're a billionaire businessman and make you want to know, want to make another few billions, you'll be forever frustrated uh, because there's never any end to greed. Uh, so as Gandhi said, this world has lots for everybody's needs, but not for everybody's greeds. Thank you. And Samdu, last word to you. Um, well, I would say that um, students, children, that you are young, you have a great opportunity in front of you. Try to eliminate your ignorance. When you are aware, you're going to eliminate your ignorance. And with that elimination of ignorance, your five poisons of mind will also disappear. The greed, excessive desire, jealousy, anger, and pride. They will also evaporate or dissolve in this uh, knowledge of awareness and never give up. Put your full efforts in what you believe is right. And what you need to do is your intention, every moment must be right. I hope this is helpful for you. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Well, thank you so much for letting me chair this session. Prateep, any final comments before we, we officially call it to a close? No, I think, you know, that, that, that was wonderful, you know, initially we thought, you know, how these two talks are going to, uh, you know, stand up to each other, but we are now seeing a lot of connections in the way that mindfulness can actually lead us into a new social contract, you know, and uh, um, as we have been saying in the spirit school, you know, uh, this is the beginning, uh, and, uh, you know, we are all dedicated, uh, including the participants, uh, to continue this further. And then this, these two talks actually sets, it, sets us up in terms of the future direction. I'll, uh, you know, I'll let you conclude it, uh, Jane, with a few words. Okay, thank you all. I just want to say what an honor it was to share the stage with, uh, with both of you, Fikred and Samdu. You're, you're inspiring people in, the, in all that you've accomplished. And so it's, it's nice to be here with you. And, uh, and so wonderful to also be with the participants from the field school. Um, I hope I get to participate someday in person. And uh, I just wish you all the best. And um, just, just know that this project that we're all part of is, um, is important to all of us. And uh, I wish you all the best. Okay, have a good day then. 
Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye for now, Fikrit.